Here we have a tiling from the Alhambra in Spain, which is this great big castle that the Moors built in the 13th century. And here we have a painting by M.C. Escher, who is a Dutch artist who lived in the 20th century. Both of these are examples of tessellations, which are tilings of the plane with no overlaps and no gaps. And both of them to me hold a little bit of a mystery. How did the artist, artists, how did they make such perfect tessellations? You know, make shapes such that they don't overlap and leave no gaps, and just tile the plane so perfectly. How can I make one of those myself? Like, come on, I want to know. Well, for starters, there is one tessellation that everyone knows, which is what you get when you take a square and you stack it on top of each other a bunch of times. You get a grid. To be more precise, say we have some translation x, which shifts the square to the right, some translation y, which shifts the square up. Then we can combine them to get a translation xy, which shifts the square right and then up. So now, say we have a square and some translation x, which shifts the square 1 to the right, and some translation y, which shifts the square 1 up. Then our square tessellation is going to be the result of applying every single combination of x and y to our original square. What's interesting is that it doesn't actually matter which square we choose to be our original square. For example, we could apply all our transformations onto this blue square right here, and you would get the grid. But you could just as well apply all the transformations onto this blue square, one square to the right, and you would still get the same grid. Another way to think about this is that we can actually shift the entire grid one unit to the right and still be the same grid. That's kind of cool. Because of this, we say that a translation of the grid one unit to the right is a symmetry of the grid. Now you might be used to thinking of symmetry in terms of reflections. So if I say something is symmetric, you might think of folding it in half and the two halves being the same. Or if you say someone's face is symmetric, it means that the two halves of their face look roughly the same. But more generally speaking, a symmetry of an object is any transformation, so any reflection, rotation, translation, or combination of those, which leaves the object the same as it started. So here we have a diagram of all the symmetries of a square. So on the very right, there is the doing nothing symmetry, which just does nothing, and the square is the same as if it started. Then one to, the left, one to the right of that, we have the symmetry which rotates the square 90 degrees counterclockwise. We can also rotate it 180 degrees or 270 degrees counterclockwise, and it'll still be the same square. And then on the right side, we have the four reflections, which also leave the square the same as it started. For a square grid, we know that shifting the grid one unit to the right leaves it the same as when we started. And we can also see that shifting it one unit up leaves it the same too. But actually, we can shift the origin to any other point in the grid, any point at all, and the grid will still be the same. So we can say that any combination of x and y is going to be a symmetry of the grid. And in fact, this kind of translational symmetry applies not just to square grids, but also things like medieval wallpaper, where we can translate it along x or y or any combination of the two, and get a symmetry of the wallpaper. Looking closer, we see that the flowers themselves are asymmetrical. So we can't really rotate or reflect this wallpaper to get a symmetry that way. So in the case of this wallpaper, the translations are the only symmetries that it has. Another way to say this is that the combination of translations x and y form the symmetry group of the wallpaper. So it turns out that wallpaper group is actually a mathematical term, and it means any symmetry group containing two independent translations. So for example, in our medieval wallpaper, our arrows x and y aren't pointing in the same direction, so they're independent, and the wallpaper does indeed have a wallpaper group as its symmetry. In the case of the footprints, you can only translate it horizontally, so it's not a wallpaper group. 
we can think of wallpaper groups as being two-dimensional in a sense. Remember the Escher painting from earlier? Well, it turns out that if we look closely enough, translating the middle white horse, x units to the right or y units up, results in the same image, the symmetries, and going colors, of course. And so any combination of x and y is going to be a symmetry of this Escher painting. And just like the medieval wallpaper, these are the only symmetries of this painting, since the horses themselves are asymmetrical. So we're going to call the symmetry group with only translations P1, and it's the simplest wallpaper group, you know, because it only has the translations required. Now wallpaper groups have to have the two translational symmetries to be called a wallpaper group, but that doesn't mean that they're restricted to only those symmetries. For example, from this tiling from the Alhambra, we have the translational symmetries as seen by the X and Y, but also notice that every individual cell is a square, and squares also have symmetries themselves. So in fact, the Alhambra tiling not only has the translational symmetries, but also has the eight square symmetries, so the four rotations and four reflections. And something like these tiles from Iran, they also have the square symmetries despite not being square shaped. So if we check, we can see that we can rotate it four times and also reflect it along the horizontal and diagonal axes, and it'll still look the same as when we started. We can also have wallpaper groups with just some of the square symmetries. So for example, in this bathroom tiling, if we take this yellow point as our origin, we see that we have all four rotations and we have reflections along the vertical and horizontal axes. But what we don't actually have is diagonal reflections. Trying to reflect along a diagonal line would turn all the horizontal tiles into vertical tiles, and all the vertical tiles into horizontal tiles, and so it wouldn't look the same anymore. And if we want to be a bit fancier, we can actually notice that this porcelain pattern from China has the same symmetries as the bathroom tiles. These tiles from the Alhambra are a little bit different. So in all the examples we've looked at so far, the symmetries have been square in a sense, in that the rotations have been fourfold, or there's no rotations at all. But in this Alhambra tiling, we can actually find a threefold rotational symmetry, where uh, we have a 120 degree rotation, which leaves the tiles the same as when they started. And these tiles from the street pavement in Poland might look a little mysterious at first, but if we keep our eyes peeled and look for a fundamental region, we can see that it actually has the same symmetries as the Alhambra tiling, where it has threefold rotational symmetry. So if we want to get a little bit weirder, we can look at this Escher painting, which does have the translational symmetries, so it is a wallpaper group. But what other symmetries does it have? You know, it looks symmetrical somehow, right? but it's a little hard to pinpoint exactly how. It turns out that this actually has glide reflections as symmetries. So glide reflection is going to be a combination of a translation and a reflection. So we can take this heart, translate it, and reflect it at the same time. And if we look closely, we can see that these yellow lines are all lines where we can apply a glide reflection to get a symmetry of this painting. At this point, you might be asking, how many different wallpaper groups are there? I mean, like, there seems to be a lot, right? You've got reflections, rotations, glide reflections, translations, and I mean, like, we haven't even covered half of them. Come on, how many are there? Well, it turns out that there's exactly 17 different ones, which is kind of surprising. It's a weird number, and to me, it seems kind of small. In fact, here's a picture for each of the 17 groups, showing their symmetries. And this 17 means that every time anyone wants to tile some flat surface, like say a wall or a bathroom floor, it means that from the perspective of symmetry, there's actually not that very, there's not that many different ways for them to tile it. And so bathroom tiles can end up with the same symmetries as Chinese porcelain, and we can find echoes of the art of the Alhambra in the streets of Poland. And hundreds of years in the future, 
people will still be using the same patterns to style their walls, buildings, and streets. And that means we're all kind of connected in this way through the symmetries of our buildings. And, I don't know, it's kind of interesting. On a more practical note, knowing how these symmetry groups are generated, it kind of uncovers the mystery of how these tessellations are made. It actually allows them to make them ourselves. So, for example, you can think of a square grid as applying the symmetry group of translations to one square. But a square doesn't have to be what we apply the symmetry group to. We can also apply it to a rectangle. And we can actually apply it to any rectangular-like object with sides being parallel. For example, these wavy sides are parallel. So we can translate it and get a tessellation. And here's another example of an object whose sides are parallel and it's kind of rectangle-like. So if we look at this square, we see that the bottom leg of the horse fits right into the upper right corner of the square. And the wing on the right of the horse fits right into that blank space on the left. And if we tessellate this horse, then what we actually get is the Escher painting from earlier. So by changing up the fundamental region, we can actually make these tessellations look a lot more mysterious than they actually are. And this works for not just these translational symmetry groups, but also a symmetry group like the Alhambra, which also has rotational symmetry groups. So if we have a fundamental region and we rotate it three times and then we translate it, what we get would be something like the Alhambra which has rotational as well as translational symmetry. And in general, this is how these tessellations are made. So we take a fundamental region, and then we apply all the symmetries to it, and see what we get. So finally, I'll leave you with a puzzle. If we take this lizard as our fundamental region, and we tessellate it, what do we get? I don't know, that's for you to figure out.